Order. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Di Natale. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The government's failure to commit adequate resources to address the national security crisis of violence against women. Is the proposal supported? The, pro the proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. And I call on Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of public urgency, which addresses the government's failure to commit adequate resources and to, in fact, address the national security crisis of violence against women. Now, it's an issue that the Greens have worked on for many years. It's an issue that, for many years, the sector has said we don't have enough funds to help everyone that reaches out seeking our help when they flee violence. We've had multiple inquiries about this. There have been multiple inquiries in other state parliaments about this. And chief amongst the recommendations has always been that frontline services need more funding. This should not come as news to the government. And I asked a question earlier today about when the sector will be heard and when the government will finally stump up the money to actually make sure that there are enough staff in those organisations so that women can be helped when they reach out, so that phone calls don't go unanswered, so that you don't have to say, no, the beds are full, we've got nowhere to put you. And sadly, the response from the Minister for Women was that I was politicising the issue. Because I was giving voice, and I'll take that interjection from Minister Rustin, who obviously concurs that it's somehow a politicisation to ask for more funding for organisations that exist on the smell of an oily rag, trying to stop people from being killed when they reach out for help, who have been saying over and over and over and over again that they don't have enough resources to keep women and children safe. If you think that's politicisation, then every single person will be disgusted at that response. The funding that this government has provided is woeful. They often bang the drum about how they've put a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, and that it's better than ever before. Well, great, but it's still not enough. We're at nine women now that have been killed this year. Last year it was 61. It's been in the order of one woman a week or more for many, many years now. The funding is clearly not enough. When are you going to fix it? We saw just late last week the minister uh, gave, I think it was $2.4 million for men's behaviour change programs. Well, what a drop in the ocean. Clearly, vastly more investment is needed in uh, support programs like that, as well as frontline services for crisis response and clearly for other prevention uh, programs. $2.4 million is an absolute insult to all of the women and children who are living in fear of their very life. And if the incidents of last week are not enough to shake this government out of their reverie, out of their denial about their ability to fix this problem, I, I don't know what is. Um, we've seen cuts to frontline domestic violence services by former administrations. It was the Abbott government that did that. Thankfully, after pressure from this Senate, after an inquiry that I initiated and that reported in 2015, we saw the government overturn some of those cuts, but it didn't actually ever have a funding increase. And we've seen in recent years funding for the Family Violence Prevention Legal Service, or FVPLS, which is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's service. That's been cut. We've seen funding for a safe phone program, which allows women who are often being tracked to, to get free and to have that telecommunications without it being bugged. That program 
the funding for that has been reduced as well, and in fact they're facing funding uncertainty. So don't sit here and tell us that you're doing everything you can when you are cutting funding to frontline services and when you are deaf to their calls for increased funding to actually help everybody that reaches out. In 2015, the sector said women are being forced to choose between violence and homelessness because there is not enough investment in crisis housing and nor is there enough investment in long-term affordable housing. 2015, you've had at least five years of that very poignant remark being put to you and still inadequate funding for homelessness services and a failure to recognise that the largest growing cohort of homeless people is older women and many of those are fleeing violence. There are so many things that this government could be acting on. Paid domestic violence leave proper funding for the courts to address some of those backlogs, proper training for judges and for the police to properly deal with family violence and domestic violence uh, situations, axing the shared parenting uh, presumption where violence exists. There are so many things, and yet all you do is give the deputy chairship of a family law inquiry to Senator Hanson, who thinks that women lie about domestic violence and who this morning was excusing the actions of a murderer. It is disgusting and it will not be forgotten. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And can I just say that I find it really disappointing that today um, that we would be debating an urgency motion written in this way. While the Clark family are grieving, while their friends and family are grieving, grieving and while the nation is grieving, I think it's particularly insensitive that we should be in here playing a blame game already. Today we should be honouring the bravery of Hannah, grieving for her loss and the loss of her children and allowing Australians to come to terms with what has been one of the most horrendous tragedies that has ever happened in this country. Today we also must acknowledge, Madam Acting Deputy President, that domestic violence in any form is unacceptable. We know that domestic, family and sexual violence is an issue for, for all Australians. It doesn't discriminate. It touches every corner of our communities and impacts people from all walks of life. It brings shame upon our nation. And we know overwhelmingly it's women and their children who are the victims of this violence. Totally unacceptable that one woman a week should use her life to a current or former partner. It's unacceptable that any woman should lose her life at the, at the hand of a previous partner or a current partner. It is absolutely abhorrent, it's dis destructive and it has a lasting effect on those who have survived it and the families that, that have not. And we must continue as governments, state government and federal government uh, and the community to make sure that we stamp out this scourge on our society. But responding to this issue is absolutely everybody's business, um, whether it be the government our government, state governments, local government, the wider community, families and individuals, we all have a role to play. And whilst it's absolutely important that we provide sufficient resources to make sure that frontline services are available, money alone will not change the dial on this issue. We need to change people's attitudes to domestic violence, and that starts with respect. To that end, I would like to commend one of the programs as part of the fourth action plan or for the, for the, uh, the, for the series of action plans, the Stop It at the Start campaign. This campaign recognises that we need to break the cycle of domestic violence uh, by encouraging adults to reflect on their own attitudes and to have conversations about respectful relationships with children. It aims to reset young people's attitudes by motivating their adult influences as role models, such as parents, members of family, teachers, coaches and community role models. The campaign um, seeks to, through four stages, recognise that domestic violence absolutely is a true problem and understanding where it can begin, and that's in childhood. We need to reconcile our role in the perpetuation of this situation, and we need to respond by increasing confidence in everyone to take action, and we need to reinforce through multiple voices for the breadth and sustainability of that campaign. In the first phase of the campaign, uh, we aim to help adults recognise and understand the link between disrespect and violence and their influence on young people. In phase two, uh, we aimed to help influence recognise what they could do uh, to, to make sure 
that they aren't misinterpreted by young people and reconcile their role in perpetuating disrespectful attitudes. We need positive role models. And the third phase, which is just about to begin, aims to empower influencers to respond to the issue by reconsidering their own attitudes and behaviours and having conversations about respect with young people. And that's why the government has committed uh, to not just dealing with the response to domestic violence, but to actively pursue the prevention and the early intervention to make sure that we make the best use of the $340 million, the biggest ever commitment by a government, uh, to addressing the scourge that is family and domestic violence under the Fourth Action Plan uh, to reduce violence against women and their children. This will take a significant and a very sustained effort, and we will not be able to do it alone. We will require partnerships with the state and territory governments, who are the first-line responders. But the reality is that it is so important that we get the language around this right. It is so important that we encourage everybody to come on this journey to stamp out this scourge on Australian society. Uh, we must make sure that our language isn't provocative. We must make sure that our language is not unhelpful. And in some instances, we've seen some language that we could only describe as downright repugnant. But its language is important, culture is important, change of behaviour is important, along with the money. Senator Billy. Thank you. Before I start my contribution, I'd just like to remind anyone listening who is experiencing family or domestic violence that there is a free 24-hour counselling service available. They can access this service by calling 1800 737 732 or 1800 RESPECT. And if you or someone you know is in immediate danger, of course, you should call Triple O instead. Madam Acting Deputy President, earlier today we observed a minute silence for Hannah Clark and her children. And this was an important gesture, but as a parliament, when we make gestures like this, we also need to back them up. We need to commit to making sure that we do everything within our power to prevent tragedies like this from happening again. And you may think that the incident at Camp Hill makes this a timely debate, but as much as this tragedy has received widespread media coverage, and as shocked and appalled as Australians are, let us not forget that one woman is murdered every week in Australia by a current or former partner. It's shocking enough that so many women are murdered, but the statistics on violence against women who survive are also quite shocking. I've taken these statistics from the website of Our Watch, which provides sources for each of these statistics. One in three Australian women have experienced physical violence since the age of 15, and one in five have experienced sexual violence. Women are three times more likely than men to have experienced violence from an intimate partner and four times more likely to be hospitalised as a result of this violence. Two-thirds of mothers with children in their care who have experienced violence from their previous partner say that their children have seen or heard the violence. So we need to ask ourselves what is the impact on these children. It's important to realise that violence against women takes many forms. It's not always just physical. It can include psychological, economic, emotional and sexual violence and abuse, and a wide range of controlling, coercive and intimidating behaviours. It's also important to realise that even when abuse in domestic and family settings doesn't involve physical violence, it can still be extremely harmful and destructive to the victims and to any children involved. In addition to those women who are losing their lives, many more are suffering physical injuries, maiming and disfigurement, which can easily obviously lead to psychological injuries and ongoing trauma. And as I've stated, this suffering is also experienced by children who are witnessing the violence or, even worse, having it perpetuated against them. We know from a wealth of evidence that leaving a violent relationship is not easy. We also know that the most dangerous time in a violent relationship is when the partner experiencing the abuse leaves. We know that the situation can be made safer for a victim when they have support around them. But because perpetuators of domestic violence often seek to isolate their victims from friends and family, victims often rely on community services funded by government when they try to leave. Yet this government is failing victims by cutting services. 
It is absolutely outrageous that when we have a national crisis in domestic and family violence and when there is a clear need to invest more in tackling the problem, this government is making cuts. The latest cut to family violence services is WESNET, a service which provides free, secure phones to women experiencing family violence so they cannot be tracked, traced or stalked by abusive partners. Because, yes, that is what often happens. Having a secure phone is often critical to a woman escaping a violent relationship. And since the program was established in 2016, WESNET has provided 20,000 of these phones. The program's national director, Karen Bentley, explained to the ABC that abusive ex-partners use mobile phones to track women and locate them after their relationship has ended. Ms Bentley said, and I quote, quite often they just either don't have a phone, they've never been able to have one, or their phone's been compromised by the abuser or potentially smashed or broken by the abuser, end quote. Now, this is such a simple program, but it can make such a huge difference for women. And this government's cut it with funding running out uh, later in this year. And another recent cut was to the National Family Violence Prevention Legal Services Forum. This service assists First Nation women who, sadly, are 32 times more likely to be hospitalised and 10 times more likely to be killed than other women as a result of violent assault. 32 times more likely to be hospitalised and 10 times more likely to be killed than other women as a result of violent assault. This organisation is the peak body for Indigenous survivors of domestic and family violence and survives on a mere $244,000 a year. Now, in the context of the federal budget, that is basically spare change, but the penny-pinching government has cut it. And to add, old, add, to add insult to injury, Guess what day the government chose to, cut, uh, chose to announce this cut? Well, it was the 25th of November, which also happens to be International Day for the Elim Elimination of Violence Against Women. That, that's true. I just couldn't believe it. It's such an unbelievable ir irony that it would be funny if it weren't so cruel and tragic. I ask those opposite when you cut these services to make a small saving here or there. Do you really understand the cost? Do you realise the impact? Do you realise that these women and families need to have support at home, in the workplace and in the court system? If women escaping violence cannot be supported, then we can expect more police call-outs, more hospitalisations, more pressure on our mental health services and, sadly, more murders. It seems that those opposite are happy to push these costs onto the states and territories if it helps to protect their precious surplus. In addition to these cuts, the government is failing to invest in the resources needed in legal services and shelter for women escaping family violence. In my home state of Tasmania, hundreds of women have been turned away from shelters which are struggling and failing to keep up with demand. In 2017, I visited community legal centres with Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus to hear about the potential impact of a planned 30 per cent cut. Now, fortunately, the government did not go ahead with that cut, but even with their funding at that time, CLCs were struggling to meet demand, including the massive demand from women escaping violence. Madam Acting Deputy President, it is not just the Liberals at the federal level who are failing women escaping domestic violence. As I mentioned in an adjournment speech last year, Tasmania's Family Violence and Counselling Support Service is only funded to handle one-third of the referrals that they receive. This means they are faced with the difficult choice of turning away victims or not offering them the full support they need. Now, they have decided not to turn anyone away. But without being able to give every client the full support and help they need, it makes it more difficult for the thousands of Tasmanian victims of domestic and family violence to safely escape. And it's extraordinary that the recently retired Premier Will Hodgman is a white ribbon ambassador, yet he allowed this to happen under his watch. For the sake of women in my home state of Tasmania trying to escape domestic, domestic and family violence, I truly hope that the new Premier, Peter Gutman, can take a more proactive approach and provide the FVCSS with the funding they need to do their job. As I said earlier, this is a national crisis and it needs an urgent national response. It requires awareness, community education and cultural and attitudinal changes. 
It requires support for victims to escape from violence and support for perpetrators to wake up and to change their behaviours. I reiterate Opposition Leader Anthony Albanese's call for a national summit on domestic and family violence. This is a practical first step that the Morrison government can take. Bring together government agencies, community groups, experts and victims to explore and develop a long-term response which drives long-term cultural change. But we need it now, not in a few years' time. We need leadership for this uh, and to make sure that this doesn't uh, fall off the agenda until the next tragedy occurs. While doing that, governments at all levels, including those opposite, need to recognise the need to invest in the services that we know work and which are already working at the front line in helping victims. We need investment, not more cruel cuts. So I hope that the people uh, of Australia, I hope that the government actually takes up Mr Albanese on his call for a national summit, that they do it quickly, that they get some uh, responses out and they start to take action a lot more quickly. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Akadi, <laughs> Acting Deputy President. Look, I rise to speak in support of this matter of public urgency. Senators spoke earlier today of the shocking murder of Hannah Clark and her three young children. Tragically, their deaths at the hands of a parent and former partner is all too common. As legislators, we have the power to do more. This is why the announcement by the Minister for Social Services last week of only $2.4 million towards men's behavioural change programs has left me incredibly bewildered. The announcement is welcome, but it's only a drop in the ocean. The sector truly needs a lot more. And on top of that, why is the funding only available in three states? New South Wales, Queensland and Western Australia. The minister hasn't explained why the funding is so low and why the funding is just limited to those three states. Domestic violence is borderless, affecting every community and socio-economic group across the nation. My home state of South Australia is desperate for more funding for behavioural change programs. One South Australian service, KWY, does incredible work helping Aboriginal families in South Australia. The safety of women and children is at the heart of everything they do. They provide specialist knowledge and culturally appropriate services to break the cycle of domestic violence. They run a specialised 12-week accountability, responsibility to change or ARC program using cultural ways to engage Aboriginal men. But incredibly, South Australia was left out of last week's announcement. And programs like the one run by KWI are at risk because of very little funding. Indigenous Australians are 32 times more likely to be hospitalised for domestic violence than non-Indigenous people. 32 times. If the government is really serious in tackling the scourge of domestic violence in Australia, it needs to get serious about providing the funding that prevention and support services ask for, and not limited to three states. At the moment, it's barely scratching the surface, and the women and children who are facing this daily reality very much deserve so much more. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Violence against women and children is not okay, and we must never make excuses for behaviour of this type. The responsibility to end violence is one that we all share. Governments have a role, communities have a role, schools, workplaces, religious institutions and the media all have a role. We all have a role to play in ending violence in our community. The violence we have seen in the past week with the deaths of Hannah Clark and her three beautiful children at the hands of her husband, the children's father 
is distressing and heartbreaking, and I hope to never hear of anything like this again. Our country has been deeply affected by these murders, and it is right that we examine what we can, what we can do to prevent such an incident being repeated. The government's first priority has always been to keep Australians safe and secure. We have a strong history in standing up against family, domestic and sexual violence. We know it is a major health and welfare issue that affects people of all ages and from all backgrounds, but we also know it mainly affects women and children. Under the government's national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, 2010 to 22, We've invested millions on providing safe places for women and children escaping violence, such as emergency accommodation, prevention strategies to stop violence before it occurs, funding for 1800 Respect, which is the National Sexual Assault Domestic and Family Violence Counselling Service, and increasing frontline services to help deal with such violence. The fourth action plan under this national plan, which was agreed with state and territory governments last year, will provide continued improvement to existing initiatives identifying and addressing gaps from earlier action plans and look at future policy areas as part of its review. Since the National Plan's implementation 10 years ago, there has been evidence of an increase in reporting of family and domestic violence. This indicates that the quality and availability of support services is increasing as is, women's trust in, is, as is women's trust in them. Community awareness of violence against women and their children is growing, and the stigma associated with being a victim and seeking help is decreasing. These are good signs. First response counsellors with 1800 Respect answered over 163,000 contacts in 2018-19, an increase of 66 per cent from the preceding year. Despite this increase, the plan states that prevalence of violence against women in Australia remains largely unchanged. But, as I quote, the gap between prevalence rates and reporting rates is diminishing as more women than ever are feeling able to seek help and support. This is a good start, but there is still much more to be done. Our government has a strong record in this area and we're committed to continue building upon this work. We have already banned the direct cross-examination of women by their alleged perpetrator during family law proceedings. We've introduced domestic violence leave. We've extended the early release of superannuation on compassionate grounds to domestic violence survivors. We're providing no interest loans to thousands of women experience family and domestic violence. And we have issued thousands of visas for women and children overseas needing safe refuge. Since 2013, we have invested more than $852 million to address the scourge of family, domestic and sexual violence. Further, we are committed to the ongoing improvement of the family law system to ensure that it helps families to separate in a safe, child-centred, supportive, accessible and timely way. The establishment of a joint parliamentary committee of both the House of Reps, Representatives and the Senate will conduct a wide-ranging inquiry into the family law system. This inquiry will hear from families accessing the family law system and provide a greater understanding of the issues and barriers they encounter. To stop violence against women, we need to counter the culture of disrespect towards women, as this is a precursor to violence. We need to change attitudes around violence by making sure that those who think violence is an option stop to stop. The National Primary Prevention Campaign, Stop It at the Start, encourages adults to stop and reflect on their attitudes and to discuss respectful relationships with children and young people. Evaluation of this program shows that the campaign is having an effect and maintaining a continued focus on showing respect for others is vital within our community. I cannot stress enough to anyone who is experiencing family or domestic violence of any kind that help is available. I encourage you to act. Reach out to trusted family, friends, your doctor or simply contact 1800 Respect. It's there for you. Domestic violence is a risk all women face. However, abuse can take different forms, none of which are acceptable. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. One woman a week in Australia is murdered by a current or former male partner, according to the Bureau of Statistics. And Aboriginal women are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised and 10 times more likely to be murdered in a violent assault. I know this also firsthand in seeing across the communities of the Northern Territory and listening 
uh, to the women in the Northern Territory who speak often about their situation and the helplessness and the hopelessness uh, that they feel in trying to remove themselves from those situations. We have terrific workers uh, in our women's uh, shelters and safe houses uh, in our communities and in particular uh, in our towns of Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, uh, Catherine and in Darwin. I've spoken here on many occasions about the concerns those shelters have uh, in terms of continued uh, funding support for the families, for the women and the children who come looking for safety and looking for a way forward uh, where they can be financially uh, capable of standing alone with their children and without being in a violent uh, home life or with a violent partner. But we know that there is more to this than funding, but I have to address the fact that there has been so much cut in the area of the services uh, to our families, certainly across the Northern Territory, but I'm acutely aware of those same calls being echoed right across the country. Even organisations like the Working Women's Centre in Australia, many of whom have been shut down or defunded. We have a wonderful uh, Working Women's Centre in the Northern Territory that's struggling. And they're able to support and talk and listen to these women who come forward wanting to be financially stable, wanting to be financially independent, to be able to remove themselves from situations that are enormously violent for themselves and their children. But there has to be an understanding, and I know we say, uh, and I've heard this a few times today, that uh, we shouldn't uh, politicise these events. I, I think we also have to be very realistic in understanding that when you remove uh, certain abilities for uh, those workers in those uh, women's shelters, in those legal services, in the working women's centres, that it has a profound and direct impact on the lives of Australian families who are in vulnerable positions. Putting your head in the sand and saying that that is not the answer is not the way to go. It really isn't. There has to be an injection of incredible amounts of support and resourcing for all of these Australians who work so hard to assist those families and whether they're working in the environments, as I've said, in the working women's centres, uh, in uh, the legal services, the women's legal services, the Aboriginal community controlled organisations, uh, they are critical to, at the front line of assisting our families who desperately need support and desperately need help. You know, I, like everyone else in this country, I was horrified to see what happened in Brisbane last week, and I certainly extend my condolences to the family of Hannah Clark and her children. It was indeed an act of horrendous violence. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, I've also seen similar acts uh, on my families uh, in the Gulf region. Uh, I can stand here and say that nearly every second woman in my family has experienced some form of violence. And we live with it. We try to support each other. I've had an auntie who is in uh, a coma for six to eight months, just trying to recover from incredible abuse. And when she came through, uh, she now lives with, uh, certainly has lost a foot and lost some toes on the other foot and uh, can hardly move her arm. Uh, so we look at uh, what kind of support she can get with uh, prosthetics to try and assist her in being able to continue to live uh, in Borulula, but it's hard. And then that's the physical trauma. What about the emotional and the spiritual and the psychological trauma that a lot of these women do not have the chance to even talk through? They don't have a chance. You know, we need these mental health workers, we need these counsellors, and certainly for First Nations women, we need them to be culturally appropriate uh, services that can be spoken in language, uh, can be in an environment where uh, these women can talk about uh, what has happened to them, and so that they can then share those stories so that it can help our younger women, wherever they are, to stand up and know that there is support out there not just in their families, but also in the services that governments at every level 
at state, territory, local government and this federal government must be providing to our Australians who are enormously vulnerable in this position. And I've certainly had other women. When I've uh, gone through to the Darwin Aboriginal Women's, uh, Darwin Aboriginal Islander Women's Shelter uh, in, in Darwin and the amazing work of people like Regina Bennett, who runs that organisation uh, on, a, on the smell of an oily rag, really, but the dedication and the loyalty of people like her and her team to ensure that they are there for these women uh, is, is outstanding. And I, I commend uh, people like Regina and others who are working in our uh, safe houses across the Northern Territory, but even right across Australia. You know, what I'm standing here and saying is not just isolated to the Territory. I know uh, that there are services in every state and Territory who try, and these employees who try to work with the vulnerable families. So there is a correlation, Senators. There is a correlation between when you remove resourcing, when you think you can take that money from this bucket here and put it over there and that should be okay, when it's not okay, when these organisations step up and say, look, this is going to dramatically impact. We're going to lose a counsellor. We're going to lose a mental health worker. We're going to lose an Aboriginal interpreter. That has an impact, a direct impact on these families. We heard uh, that late last year, the same day as International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, uh, certainly the Morrison government told the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services Forum its $244,000 a year funding would not be renewed past June 2020. And that forum is critical in bringing Indigenous women's voices to the table when family violence policies and approaches are being discussed. When the government is effectively, what the government is effectively doing by cutting this minuscule amount of money, minuscule in terms of what the government can afford, when it goes to uh, the Tyndall Air Base and says, here's a billion dollars uh, for, for, for the Air Force, and yet it removes $244,000, which impacts the Catherine women in that region. It just doesn't make sense. And that's where you have to see the government senators, the government members, that there is a direct correlation to those decisions. The forum had a meeting with the Indigenous Australians Minister earlier this month, but despite making sympathetic noises, uh, the minister was unable to give the forum any assistance they would be able to, uh, any assistance or any assurance that they would be able to operate into the future. They're asking for $244,000 a year. Instead, the minister has told the sector, already thinly resourced and outstretched, to engage in a co-design process. But the sector is very strongly of the view that why redesign something they know already works? So I'll give you an idea of how this government will cuts will impact services on the ground in the NT. The National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Service Forum supports a small culturally appropriate Indigenous frontline services to ensure their experiences and views are reflected in national discussions. So if you're going to remove that, you're saying to the women of the Northern Territory in this instance that their voices don't matter, but you're also saying to the vulnerable women right across Australia that it's not a priority. And listening to the senators today, listening to Senator Cormann uh, speak today, I know that you know it's important. And I'm just asking you to recognise that when you make those decisions of funding, it does have a profound and direct impact on our families across Australia when these organisations are either so under-resourced or have to close shop and it's not good enough. Yeah. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this matter of public urgency on the national security crisis of violence against women. In the wake of the truly horrific murder of Hannah Clark and her three beautiful innocent children, it is absolutely essential that we as a nation reiterate 
that violence is never acceptable in any form. There is never any justification. No excuses, no ifs, no buts. None. We need to call out the toxic culture of some men and their supporters, some of whom raise these issues in this place, who think they are entitled to exert power and control over women. That is at the heart of this violence towards women and their children. Women think that they can rely on the justice system and the police to respond to the violence that is being perpetrated against them. But too often we see that that is not the case. We see in the media today there's a very brave woman who took her own civil action because the police didn't think it was in the public in interest to prosecute when someone doused them in petrol and threatened to set them alight. We see domestic violence orders, they call other things in other states, AVOs, simply ignored, not worth the paper they are written on. So how can we say that people can have confidence in our justice systems when this is continuing to happen. For every woman, and we've heard of one a week that loses their life, there are thousands and thousands of women and their children who are living the daily, daily reality of violence and abuse. Exposure to violence against their mothers or other caregivers causes profound harm to children and has lifelong effects for those children. It is not good enough to say, well, it's okay, we're giving money. We're spending this and we're spending that, when we know that, over that $5 billion is needed to address this crisis. And just last year, at the end of last year, we had the National Family Violence Prevention Legal Services were told that their funding of only $244,000 was going to be cut, and the government, using the weak suppose the recommendations of a report, the weak excuse of that, when the report made no recommendations at all, the government needs to act to stop that. We've just heard Senator McCarthy's contribution about how the 32 times impact on First Nations women of domestic violence, and yet the government thinks it's okay to cut funding to one of their essential services. In 2006, this, the Howard government made the mistake of amending the family law to put parents' shared care above the interest of the child. It was a fundamental mistake, and we called it out at the time. The, these mistakes cannot continue. We need to invest. We need to change the laws. We need to enforce the current laws and change the laws to ensure that this doesn't happen. And we importantly have to call out any excuse for violence. There is no excuse. We have to call it Thank out you, every Your single time. Has expired. time. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I was at the vigil in Camp Hill last night when Nikki Brooks spoke bravely for her beautiful friend, for Hannah Clark and her children, Alia, Liana and Trey. I want to refer to some of her speech now to remind all of us in this chamber of the important things she had to say. She said, we are a nation in pain. Whether you knew our beautiful Hannah or not, we are all deeply affected by this tragedy. I see her face on television, her smile like sunshine. She has the face of a friend. And maybe that's what it is that hurts, that she is so instantly relatable and that we are not only heartbroken for her family, but we've all become a little scared for our own. I wish I had something profound to tell you. The perfect message of how we stop the violence, how we take away the rage. But yet, if I had it all figured out, we wouldn't be standing here today. What I will tell you is that in their short lives, Hannah, Alia, 
Liana and Trey loved hard and laughed hard every day. Hannah carried the weight of the world on her shoulders and you never knew it. Her strength of character was only matched by her wicked sense of humour. Giggles filled their days and they were truly happy. I don't want us to get caught up in a blame game that takes us beyond the animal that did this. There was no excuse. There could never be an excuse. No buts. The blame lives and dies with him. And you can do all the call to arms you want, blame the system and demand change, but there is no quick fix. I don't think there's a single law or order that would have saved our darlings. Monsters find a way. So what can we do? Little boys in pain grow into angry men. I want every person in this crowd to now turn to someone right now and cuddle them. Last night at the vigil, strangers did. She said, get used to saying I love you out loud. Saying to our babies that being tough and strong isn't just physical. Kindness is emotional strength. Stop being so polite, she said. It's none of our business and I don't want to get stuck in the middle are keeping secrets silent and the suffering is breeding. Those phrases are isolating. Don't back away from your friends for the sake of convenience. Don't be gutless. If you see something, say something. One by one, we can let the world know we won't stand for this anymore. Time's up for domestic violence. Gosh, she said it well. No parent ever should have to experience what Suzanne and Lloyd Clark have over the last week. When I think of the cruelty and pain inflicted on Hannah, Liana, Trey and Alia, and by a father whose basic duty was to love and protect them, I feel sick. And yet, this happens. Murder happens. Perhaps less dramatically, perhaps less visibly, but it happens to another woman every week. It's not okay. It's never okay. Domestic violence must end. I actually don't like the term. It shouldn't be treated like it's something different or less than because it's connected to the family. If anything, it's worse. It's a bigger breach of trust, a bigger betrayal of the oath between husband and wife, between parent and child. And yet, every two minutes, the police get a call out about a family violence incident. I'm sad to see Senator Di Natale attempt to politicise this sad and complex social issue with this motion because it crosses generations and cultures. It crosses through the rich and through the poor and it isn't the sole result of alcohol or other substance abuse. In 2015, the Not Now, Not Ever report commissioned by the Newman government was given to the Queensland government. This cross-party task force included people who worked in the area of domestic violence, including in Indigenous groups and multicultural groups, and was led by former Governor Dame Quentin Bryce, <coughs> Governor-General, I beg your pardon. And the report lists a range of factors which contribute to domestic violence and the danger that women find themselves too often in, in trying to get out of dangerous relationships. Those factors include the law, police, culture, different cultures in our community, generational abuse, substance abuse and the availability of safe places to go. But when you look at what Hannah had done, it was clear she'd had good advice on getting out safely. She had reported the latest violence against her to the police. She had moved out. She was living with her parents. She had identified safe houses in her local area. She'd had an order issued that was supposed to protect her. She did everything right. Textbook, really. She was smart, well-educated, healthy, beautiful, a great example to her children with a loving, supportive extended family. Maybe that's why it hurts so much, because we don't expect bad things like this to people 
to happen to people who look like her. But it does. It touches all walks of life. What happened to Hannah and her children was pure evil. But the question of what we do next is hard. We can't legislate as a government for people to be kind. We can't legislate for love. Nikki correctly identified that little boys in pain grow into angry men and that it's parents' job to model and show them how to love one another. They also need to show little girls what is and isn't acceptable to receive in terms of conduct from the people they love. Parents are working on this and there are social workers and chaplains in virtually every school in this country working with children from homes which are not safe, trying to make that change. As I said, we can't legislate kindness, but in the event that a person finds themselves in a violent situation of this kind, there are now more practical measures in place than ever to help them get out. Last year, the Prime Minister, along with the then Minister for Women, committed $328 million for the fourth action plan under the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children between 2010 and 2022. It's record funding. Prevention measures were funded to $68.3 million worth to stop violence before it even happens. $35 million specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community women and $78 million for shelters and women seeking safety from their abusive partners. And since 2015, the Coalition has spent $840 million to help suffering domestic violence victims get out and rebuild their lives. In the 2019-20 budget, the Minister secured more funding to speed up parenting payment processing times and property settlements. $7 million was committed to create the family violence um, and cross-examination of party schemes, so funds for legal aid expressly to ensure that a person injured by domestic violence doesn't have to face their abuser in court. And it's been complemented by an amendment to the Family Law Act, banning self-representation in these instances. $31.8 million was allocated to Commonwealth-funded specialist units, and $50.4 million went into Family Law Property Mediation Services. And in 2018, the then minister introduced five days of unpaid family and domestic violence leave. It was the first time any government had enshrined that as a workplace right. There's no doubting that family breakdown is among the hardest things a person can ever experience in their life, one made more complex when drugs, mental health issues and child safety concerns are added into the mix. And we can't expect any government to be able to turn this trauma into a happy time of life. But we can and we must do everything possible as a government as families, as friends, as communities, to keep each other safe. It's time we looked not just to the government, but also to what we can do as individuals, because more of this just will not do. Lloyd, I gave you a big hug last night with tears in both our eyes. We won't forget Hannah, and we won't forget her kids, and we won't give up on making this right. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The shocking murder last week of Hannah Clark and her three lovely children is the latest tragedy, tragedy in an all uh, too repeated horror across our nation. As a father of two daughters, my heartfelt desire is that they are able to contribute and thrive in a society that values their opinion and provides them the opportunity to live free from harm and fear and retribution. I want my daughters, I want all daughters and all Australian women to always be safe in their home and as they go about their daily lives. While the motion for debate today focuses on questions of Commonwealth funding, and that is a very important part of the picture, I think it's true to say that successive governments and indeed our political processes as a whole have failed to deal with this horrific issue. There have already been many uh, inquiries and reports. The Victorian Royal Commission, two inquiries undertaken by the Senate uh, Finance and Public Administration References Committee, 
and an Auditor General's recent report on the implementation of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children. And yet, nothing much has changed. The national rates of serious crime, murder and assaults are falling, but the rates of family violence are sadly static. Things are not getting any better. On average, one Australian woman is killed by an intimate partner each week. Hannah Clark was the eighth woman murdered by her former partner in Australia this year. Australian police deal with 5,000 uh, domestic violent matters on average every week. That's one every two minutes and 20 since this debate commenced. Cuts in funding of frontline uh, social welfare and support services definitely haven't helped, but they are only a small part of a complex picture. Moreover, against a backdrop of terrible tragedy and hurt, there is no merit in partisan argument and finger-pointing. What we uh, do need right now is collective action. Action across the Australian parliaments uh, to pressure governments, uh, federal, state and territories to tackle this issue in ways that really will make a difference. Now, to that end, I am proposing an urgent inquiry by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee into family violence, especially violence against women and their children. The focus of the inquiry will be on action, not endless investigation. We know about the prevalence of domestic violence. We know its causes and contributing factors. We know its effects on health. We know its, uh, its impact on children. We know its uh, financial impact and its impact on the community. The dimensions of the problem are really clear, and we don't need to re-examine that. Rather, we need a process through which senators can directly pressure governments on, on the steps they need to take and the resources that need to be committed now uh, that will eliminate domestic violence from our uh, Australian society. We need to look at where we can drive change in government policy, programs and resourcing to improve outcomes. With strong commitment from uh, senators from all sides of politics, uh, we can do all of this and more. It's high time that all sides of this parliament, and especially all segments uh, of, uh, of Australian society, and indeed uh, most particularly men, faced up to our collective responsibilities and worked for real change. Now, in closing, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President, I'll just make a final observation that uh, there were no uh, male uh, members of the Liberal Party speaking uh, today. There were no male members of the Labor Party or indeed of the Greens. And I just ask you to reflect on that. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this debate. And I'm just following on from uh, Senator Patrick. I would uh, commend Senator Patrick and Senator Griff for um, being um, uh, two men participating in this debate today. And uh, I too reflect on the observations of the lack of uh, male voices in this debate. I know this is a restrained time. Um, it's uh, constrained in terms of the it's only an hour and lots of people want to speak. Um, I would be more than happy. Um, to step aside uh, if, if there was a uh, male colleague um, from any side of politics who wanted to participate in this debate today, because I think it is absolutely important uh, that um, uh, decent men um, become part of this very much needed uh, discussion about how we solve these issues going forward, because we know too many women and their children are at risk, are living in fear right now today uh, in their own homes. And as we pay uh, tribute uh, and um, grieve for the loss of life over the last week um, of Hannah Clark, her children, um, and uh, sadly, another woman who only died uh, was murdered um, at the hands of her partner uh, only days later in Townsville. And sadly, these statistics um, should not be shocking because they're so regular. And that is what is wrong here. But when something as grievous and as horrific as what occurred last week in Brisbane, um, there is a glimmer of hope that people were so outraged by this, so touched by this. I myself um, I felt quite haunted by it. I couldn't shake for two days, uh, the stories, the reports, 
the images that I had seen. I could not stop thinking about Hannah and those children. And I've never met this family. I know nothing about them but what I've read since this tragic event, um, but it shook me deeply. And I think many, many Australians feel the same. That's why we're discussing this today. Um, but we have to use that um, grief, um, that anger, that frustration uh, to call for genuine and real action. And as my colleagues have already uh, mentioned today, Senator Waters and uh, Senator Seawitt, um, at the very least, we should be able to commit uh, from a funding perspective that no woman is ever turned away when she asks for help, when she is in danger, um, she should be able to get a safe place for her to, her to sleep, a safe place for her children to be. There should be somebody at the end of the phone uh, when a woman calls in desperate need of assistance. And the fact that there is not is a national shame. And the fact that this issue uh, is now at a rate, such an epidemic rate, that one woman is killed a week, that is not okay. It is 2020 in modern Australia where equality is meant to be part of the norm where young girls are brought up believing that they can be anything, that they are equal. To see the reports of mothers and their children being murdered at the hands of the very people who are meant to love and protect them, I tell you what, equality has time still has a long way to go. Thank you. The time for this debate has expired. The question is that the matter of urgency motion proposed by Senator Di Natale be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Where have I? Paul Philip. Ayes have it. Thank you. Okay.